A few months back, I invited you guys to ask me any question you wanted and said I would answer 10 of them. One of those questions came from Jack Cole and here's what he said and how I replied. Question number three. This was the question with the most likes in the YouTube comment section. Jack Cole says, your video about the rain was fantastic. Could you make a video about Oasis's career in the period from them being formed up to definitely maybe? I wasn't particularly planning to do a video on that phase, but yeah, all right, why not? Give me a few months and I will try and sort something out, a documentary deep dive on that phase in the life of Oasis. Good idea. In my video, When Oasis Were The Rain, I told the story of the very earliest origins of the group before they were even called Oasis, right up to the point at which Liam Gallagher joined on vocals in 1991. I'm gonna pick things up from Liam joining and tell the story of how the band went from their first gig as Oasis to becoming record deal ready. And it's a really fascinating story because so many people consider Oasis to be just a scruffy bunch of shit kickers who got lucky. But when you dig below the surface, you realize that that is all actually just a facade. It's all part of the legend, if you like, of the band. Below the surface, tucked away in an obscure corner of Oasis history, is the truth about how those guys made it. And the idea that they were just a bunch of scruffy, lazy scroungers who were discovered and just got lucky couldn't be further from the truth. We left the story after Liam Gallagher had auditioned to join the band. Liam, of course, passed the audition and, right from the word go, they started bringing original material to rehearsals to learn. Tony McCarroll tells it this way. After a few rehearsals in which Liam introduced some new songs that he had been working on, we started to get a feel. It was strange at first, former frontman Chris Hutton not being up front, but we all recognised the fact that Liam had something about him. It might have been menacing and slightly evil, but it was still something. As we were developing our original material, Life in Vain, Reminisce, She Always Came Up Smiling and Take Me were the standout tracks. Lyrically, these songs were a collaboration between Liam and Bonehead. And here is a short snippet of each of those original songs, all of which are available on YouTube if you want to hunt down the full versions. I used to live my life in vain Until today it's been the same I've gone away to disappear My life with you was just today In his book, Giving It The Biggin, friend of the band Paul Ashby tells a little bit of the background as to how those earliest songs by Liam and Bonehead were actually written. Biggin says, me and Liam had decided to visit Didsbury Library in search of lyrics. I had read one of the Happy Mondays in an interview citing it as a great place for lyrical inspiration. We visited a number of times and from these visits and with Bonehead's musical accompaniment, the songs Life In Vain, Take Me, Reminisce and She Always Comes Up Smiling were born. Since joining the band, Liam had seemingly already become the driving force behind it. Of this very earliest period, older brother Paul Gallagher says this. Liam was well into being in a band and to be fair to him, he doesn't always get the credit that he should for really going for it. Liam isn't the easiest going person you are likely to meet, but he wanted to be in a band that much, he put everything into it. He was determined. Liam was on the dole at the time, but he really believed in the band, even if nobody else did. 
Paul Ashby confirms that Liam's arrival in the band caused the whole outfit to shift up a gear. Rehearsals had upped and even Tony agreed that Liam was a fresh change that had been needed. Tony had been upset when Chris Hutton had been ousted from the band, but luckily for all, he was already a friend of Liam's. The band were really beginning to tighten and you could hear the wall of sound that the rhythm section would bring to early Oasis beginning to blossom. You could also see the confidence growing in Liam daily. It seems the band as a whole were massively pleased with everything Liam was bringing to the table. He, however, wasn't yet satisfied. Quite correctly, he seemed to sense that there was a jigsaw piece missing and began to push to bring in his older brother, Noel. Tony McCarroll confirms this, saying, everyone in the band thought that Liam had the charisma and natural personality to take it somewhere. Everyone except Liam, that is. He wanted to invite his brother, Noel, to join the group. Liam had already played a demo of Noel in a band called Fantasy Chicken and the Amateurs to us. In truth, it was not very impressive, but he did know a lot of people in the industry, so we put him on the back burner. Unfortunately, to date, that demo of Noel with Fantasy Chicken and the Amateurs has not surfaced on YouTube or anywhere that I'm aware of online. You can, however, go check out episode 191 of the Oasis podcast to find out more. At this time, Noel Gallagher was working for Manchester band The Inspiral Carpets as a roadie. He was out with them on tour, learning about the way the industry worked back then from the inside. And he was also dating a girl called Louise Jones, who has been for some reason completely lost to history, who worked for a music productions company. So he had that connection as well. In the Supersonic book, Liam says this, I thought the main thing was getting Noel in the band. He was a songwriter. He'd been doing it for quite a bit. He was a lad. He was touring with the Inspiral Carpets, so he'd seen a bit. I thought when he comes back and sees that we're doing it instead of talking about it, he'll want to join our band and he'll do the business. And so with this in mind, once the earliest version of Oasis, the four piece version were ready, they booked their first gig at the boardwalk in Manchester and invited Noel. And this is the first of many early Oasis gigs and they all follow an interesting pattern. Almost none of them were done just for the sake of the gig. They were always an audition of some kind. They always had a purpose beyond the gig itself. This gig was the band trying to recruit Noel. Biggin says, things were progressing rapidly with the band. We had organized a gig at the boardwalk in Manchester. It was to be the first time that Oasis were to appear. And so it was a big deal to us. It was August, 1991 and Oasis made their first appearance. The club would soon become home to the band as a rehearsal spot, but first they would entertain the patrons upstairs. Only they didn't. The three songs in the set all had performance issues. So we ended up playing six songs or rather the same three song set twice. It was strange. I had watched them rehearse for the previous year and knew that Liam's stage presence was their strongest asset. Yet on that first night, it just wasn't there. Tony McCarroll says this about their first gig. It was a warm evening and we were expecting a large turnout. We were also expecting Noel. Liam had invited him down and seemed genuinely excited that his big brother was coming to see us. We played and we were tight, but the set was pretty uneventful. After we had finished, Liam went out front to see Noel and ask him what he thought. Fucking shit came the reply. Liam returned backstage, his fringe still stuck to his forehead with sweat. He was deflated after his brother's cutting two word review. Then Biggin entered the room smiling. Hey, your kid fucking loved that. He said with a laugh, Liam looked at him quizzically and asked, how do you figure that? Biggin then told Liam that Noel had been engrossed, excitedly telling his girlfriend just how much potential the band had. Noel just couldn't bring himself to tell Liam that that news changed Liam's mood instantly and we were back on track. And so despite it being a bit of a mess, their first gig was actually successful. They effectively passed the audition. We all knew that Noel was itching to join in, but we decided to let him sweat. We were sounding tight and definitely had our own unique sound. We also knew that Noel had a couple of songs he had written, which would give us a grand total of seven. It was the perfect match and one that Liam had longed for, but it was fun to make Noel sweat. 
the Noel version of events, which sees him joining armed with a clutch of hit records already penned, assuming the nickname The Chief, and immediately starting to dish out orders, is utter nonsense. In fact, before there was any consideration of asking Noel to join as a musician, they invited him to join as their manager because he had so much industry experience and so many connections behind the scenes. Noel says, they were playing at the local band night. I went down to see them and I remember being pretty impressed. They had their own songs and Liam didn't look that out of place and I thought, fucking hell, that's pretty good. It didn't dawn on me at all that I was gonna join that band. They came up and said, we're thinking, would you fancy being our manager? I replied, no, I'm not sure about that. I think you can get a better manager than me. But following that first gig, the idea of having Noel involved was now definitely hanging in the air. And for the remainder of 1991, they continued to write and rehearse, albeit in a slightly indisciplined way. They also began making plans to go to the studio for the very first time. Biggin says, Bonehead had arranged some recording time for us on the premise that he would plaster the actual studio that we would use and we would have to help out through labouring. It was an unusual arrangement, but one that worked for all. And during this, their first recording session, the idea of Noel actually joining the band as a musician seems to have been put forward for the first time and not actually on guitar, but on bass. Tony McCarroll says, Liam had mentioned that Noel still kept hinting at joining us. During a chat one lunchtime in Piccadilly Gardens, I sensed he seemed to be skirting around something until finally he came out with, why don't we replace Gwigsy with our Noel? I reminded him that it was Gwigs who had first set up this outfit. To Liam's credit, he looked guilty and almost immediately backed down and apologized. I suggested a compromise. Why don't we have Noel join as lead guitarist? As that was his instrument of choice, it made sense. Liam's guilt instantly evaporated, now he was animated. I'll go and tell him where we are recording, he replied. And so the band took further baby steps towards Noel officially joining. It seems, however, that Noel didn't just immediately jump on board. Paolo Hewitt tells this story about the early days when Noel was just turning the idea over. Noel couldn't ditch his job with the Inspiral Carpets. He earned good wages. No way did he want to go back on the dole. So Noel prevaricated. What he did was to invite the boys round to his flat in India House in Manchester to play them a few of his songs. He not only had an ear for melody, but his arrangements had class as well. They determined to get Noel in as soon as possible. Tony also talks about a very early meeting between him and Noel, and the first time Noel joined the band for a rehearsal. It was good to see Noel. We talked about the band and how great a musician Bonehead was. He told me he had a few songs of his own that he wanted to slip in. He was genuinely excited though, and was desperate not to step on Bonehead's toes. We headed off to the rehearsal room together. We plugged in and started playing. He picked his guitar up and started to lay down some backing riffs for Take Me. No one had asked him to, but it felt right. After the session, we all welcomed him onto the Good Ship Oasis, and he suggested that we start rehearsing at the boardwalk. In the supersonic book, Noel too remembers that first rehearsal, saying this. A couple of weeks later, Liam said, come and jam with us. So I went and sat in with them playing their tunes and it was great. I think the second time I went, I had a riff or something. Once everybody joins in and you hear this thing that you've written being played back to you in this room, it's like, wow, fucking hell. There is the myth that I kicked open the rehearsal room door to the theme tune from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and said, everybody stop what they're doing. I'm here to make us all millionaires. There wasn't that at all. I kind of fell into the whole thing by accident, really. And so, having jammed with the band a couple of times and been welcomed aboard, Noel joined them at Out of the Blue Studios to help record their first demo. But it seems that Bonehead, initially at least, wasn't happy to have Noel come in and replace him on lead guitar. Because, as you can see from the cassette notes on the Out of the Blue sessions, Noel actually joined initially on rhythm guitar. He would officially take over lead guitar at a later date. At this point, the band began to rehearse more regularly. Tony McCarroll says this, We were rehearsing twice a week, Thursday and Sunday. Noel was still working for the Inspirals, so did not attend regularly. It wasn't the initial rush we'd been expecting. When he did attend though, he brought with him three songs, Must Be The Music, See The Sun, and I Better Let You Know. The first two were a disaster, 
with the nature of the songs not sitting with the style of our music at all. The song I Better Let You Know, however, suited my lazy drumming style and the dancing wall of strings from Bonehead and Gwigsy. Liam looked comfortable delivering the lyrics in his own unique way. Now because much of this is ancient history, it's hard to know what has been misremembered. And I say that because the song Tony references here, I Better Let You Know, was not written by Noel, it was a cover of a popular dance tune. So if he's remembering rightly, that's funnier than Tony realises because Noel was claiming to have written a song that was in the charts. But of course, this is all over 30 years ago, so who knows. According to Paolo Hewitt, when Noel finally did commit to the band, he ushered in a new era of professionalism. He was at that time still working for a famous, successful, signed touring band, and so he knew what the expected standard was. He also knew what the required work ethic was as well. Here's what Paolo Hewitt says. Typically, Noel took the cool approach. A month after the Boardwalk show, Noel Gallagher finally committed himself to Oasis, but only under some strict provisos. The first was that they would give their everything to the band. No one would be allowed to miss rehearsals. Everybody had to make a 100% effort. Failure to do so would mean dismissal. Noel would carry on with the Inspirals, and while he was away, the others would have to keep on working. Any money they had would be put towards the cause. They all eagerly agreed. By laying down these conditions, Noel Gallagher confirmed himself as the band's leader. As time moved on, only his brother would ever challenge his right to that title. And once Noel was in the band, rehearsals became hardcore. The old unstructured jam sessions were out and focused, dedicated rehearsals were in. In the Supersonic book, Bonehead says, we were pretty committed and dedicated to rehearsing. It didn't matter what night it was or who was doing what. People couldn't understand it, but that's how we developed our sound playing those songs as a unit every night. I was working, Griggs was working, so he would just finish work and walk straight down the boardwalk every single night. We didn't go in there and say, all right, let's have an hour's jamming. We'd have a set list of songs that we play again and again and again, night after night. And Noel adds, for us, rehearsing was sacred. We would never go out on tour without two months of solid rehearsing, day after day, because people are gonna come and see you and you have got to blow them away. And so, Noel was in, the first demo was recorded and they had their second gig booked once again at the boardwalk for January, 1992. That year opened with the band playing their first ever gig as a five piece. And of this gig in the Supersonic book, Noel says this, I was rehearsing with them and then Bonehead said, we've got a gig next Tuesday, the first one and it hadn't dawned on me until that moment that I'd never played guitar standing up. I had to borrow a guitar strap from someone and it was a big thing learning to play that set of songs in about five days standing up. Noel was still with the Inspiral Carpets and so they came along to support him and to watch the gig. Inspiral's band member Clint Boone said this, I remember Noel's first gig with the band. There weren't many people there, probably 20 of us and five of those were the Inspiral Carpets. It wasn't the oasis that we came to know, and Liam was very much still under the spell of Ian Brown. All in all, it seems that, despite having had a year of constant practices, the band weren't really there yet. The gig didn't really make any impression on anybody in the audience. But the band themselves were growing in confidence, 
and the whole gig was actually recorded on tape and is available to listen to on YouTube. And that second gig, once again, was a gig with a function. It wasn't just a gig for a gig's sake. Whereas that first gig where there was still a four piece had been a kind of audition to try and get Noel interested, I think this second gig was a kind of audition to try and get the Inspiral Carpets interested. I reckon on some level, they were hoping to be able to secure a support slot with the Inspirals. So we have yet another gig with a specific purpose. They didn't just rush out and take every pub gig they could possibly get, no matter where. They seemed to approach gigs in a kind of surgical way. Each gig had to serve a purpose and had to at least offer the chance of furthering their career. After a very uneventful start to 1992, the band continued to rehearse. The cellar room at the boardwalk resembled a dungeon. New mould grew over the old mould on the damp brick walls and there was a puddle of water where the concrete floor dipped in the middle of the room. We decided that the place needed brightening up and so the following week we set about whitewashing the walls. Me and Liam stole two tins of bright white from B&Q in Ancoats and the four of us set about slapping it on the walls. We then had to stick posters up to break the colour up a bit as we would all have been suffering from snow blindness otherwise. We also painted a Union Jack on the wall as a tribute to The Who. And this is the era in which the famous video of the band rehearsing all around the world is taken. You can see them in that rehearsal space with the Union Jack on the wall, jamming a song that would be released about five years later as a single, hit number one, and make history as the longest single ever to do so in the UK at nine minutes and 20 seconds long. Now, of course, the reason Noel Gallagher was originally invited to be the band's manager was he had so many connections in the industry. And it seems that behind the scenes, the whole time, he was constantly pushing at doors. And occasionally, one or two of those doors would open. Midway through 1992, apparently Oasis's first ever radio interview occurred. Many people believe their first radio broadcast was Hit the North in 1993. But according to Tony McCarroll, it actually occurred in 92. It was the summer of 1992 and we were in the boardwalk and readying ourselves. That day, we were off to BBC Radio Studios on Oxford Road, Manchester to record for In Session. It was a big day for us. It had been sorted out by a friend of Noel's girlfriend, Louise, which had left Noel in a deadly certain mood. Just be nice, no swearing or kicking off, he politely advised us. Noel told us that his missus Louise had pulled a few strings and there would be murders if we took the piss. He was deadly serious. The show we had been asked to appear on was Hit the North. We walked the short distance from the boardwalk to Oxford Road Studios, set up our equipment and got ready for our first public broadcast. We fired out Take Me to polite applause from the hosts. Noel and Liam were asked for a quick question and answer session and agreed. Peter Hook started with a welcoming open question, but Liam wasn't interested and ignored it. What the fuck are you doing wearing leather trousers? He asked instead. Hooky then told Liam he wouldn't be welcome in the Hacienda if he carried on like that. Give a fuck mate, it's shit anyway, came the offhand reply. Liam's first ever broadcastable sentence contained swearing and an insult. Brilliant. We waited in hope that the broadcast might have alerted some eager record company who had a nose for obvious brilliance. It didn't. To my knowledge, the audio of their first appearance in 1992, where they performed Take Me, has not yet surfaced. But if you have a copy, I'd love to hear it. And while we're talking about long lost first performances, Oasis's first television performance was also in 1992, and that footage has never made it to air. Many people, including the band, have said that Oasis's first TV appearance was on The Word, playing Supersonic. According to multiple sources, however, that actually wasn't the first one. Their first one was in 1992, with the whole band miming along to their five-piece demo of the song Take Me for Granada TV. Tony McCarroll says, Noel revealed he had some good news. We waited eagerly to hear what was coming. We're going on TV, he said. Oddly, Noel himself seemed only half excited by his own announcement. I was worried at that. Surely this was a big thing for us. Noel said, 
we're going to be on Granada. It's Red Nose Day and we're going to be supporting Alvin Stardust. This explained the half-hearted announcement. Alvin fucking Stardust. Whoopee. Isn't that the silly cunt in the gold glitter jacket? Asked Bonehead. He's a fucking genius, said Noel, leaving the rest of us surprised, to say the least. And in the supersonic book, Noel sheds a little more light on this long lost event. Noel says, was it Red Nose Day? It definitely wasn't children in need. It must have been something though. I've got a feeling it was a bit more local than that. It was Save the Hot Pot or something, National Flat Cap Day. We went on after Alvin Stardust and we mimed to one of our demos. The guy introduced us as a rave band, unbelievable. How that footage has never come out is amazing. Obviously, someone's just flipped the camera off and gone, fuck these cunts, do you know what I mean? Tony continues, we burst onto the stage ready to be amazed. The steel roadside barriers were in place to control the baying mob of fundraisers and Granada staff, all 12 of them. The cameras began to record as the compare faced the crowd and began in his big showbiz voice. Let us now welcome Oasis, who have just flown back to be with us from their tour. Oasis. He swept his arm round and stood facing us with a cheesy grin. A bead of sweat slowly rolled from his brow and down his forehead as he was met by silence. We've just come from Burnage, dickhead. We ain't on fucking tour, snapped Liam. The crowd erupted in laughter from the school choir to the Salvation Army as we launched into Take Me and Liam stared the compare down off the stage. We performed more than adequately and received as much a response as you'd expect from a mimed performance to a crowd full of kids and ambulance staff. So let's look at this long lost performance. Was it actually filmed? I'll tell you when we did one fucking weird thing, it was at Granada TV and it was before we were signed I mean, before we had any songs, and we'd done some tune called Take Me or something, and we didn't have a drum kit, and we borrowed Alvin Stardust's fucking drum kit. <laughs> really? Yeah, and it was outside on the lawn at Granada TV. I don't know if there's any footage of it anywhere, but... According to Biggin's book, however, it was filmed, but never actually broadcast. So, if you work for ITV Granada, there's some long-lost important historical footage of Oasis somewhere in your vaults. Dig it out, and let's have a look. Oasis rehearsed intensively and played a few more unremarkable gigs throughout that year, with Noel behind the scenes constantly pushing at doors. They got a short interview in the Manchester Evening News, and in September of that year, they performed at the Manchester In The City International Music Seminar. But again, nothing really came of it. Noel says, we'd done this festival in Manchester called In The City, where all the record labels come. It was an unsigned band night. We did two of those. Fuck all. Not even a drink. Nothing. No one even said we were shit. We were completely and utterly fucking ignored. I'd already written the first three albums. I knew, for instance, that All Around the World was going to be the last track on our third album before I'd even got a record deal. Bonehead used to laugh and say, what third album? We've not even got a manager. But I truly believed that it would come to pass. I don't know where that belief came from. And so you can see there that even though they were just doing these small little gigs, they were still doing gigs with a clear purpose. They managed to perform at an international music seminar. They were only on the unsigned band slot, but they were constantly aiming for exposure to the people who could launch their career. They came up against so many seeming failures, so many half empty gigs or lukewarm reviews. Through Noel Gallagher's friends and connections, they got featured in the newspaper, but nothing came of it. Through his connections, they got a radio interview. Nothing came of it. Again, through industry connections, they even got filmed for a TV broadcast, but nothing came of it. But in the face of all these setbacks, they never gave up and they never threw in the towel. They never became passive and just said, this clearly isn't meant to be. They were determined to make it happen. As it turned out, just around the corner was what would at first glance appear to be a massive setback for Noel. In reality, it would turn out to be the making of the band. Oasis continued to rehearse with or without Noel until somewhere towards, I think, the end of 1992, his employment with the Inspiral Carpets came to an end. Paolo Hewitt says, 
The Inspirals had decided they no longer required Noel's services. Maybe there had been too many complaints about his behaviour, or maybe the band, as they explained to Noel and to sound engineer Mark Coyle, no longer had the finances to pay them. Whatever the reason, Noel was seriously pissed off. He now had to sign on, and there is nothing worse than having to adjust your living standards to a much lower level. In the Supersonic book, Noel tells this story. The actual reason why I got sacked is amazing. We were travelling all on the same bus, the band and the crew, and it's back in the day before open borders and all that. The band would be at the front of the bus, and all the fucking potheads would sit at the back. Somebody would come up and say, we're coming to the Spanish border. The singer was asleep in his bunk. We had to clean the fucking bus up, there were drugs everywhere. The sniffer dogs got on and all that and there's a fucking scene. As the bus is pulling off, the lead singer wakes up, I'm stood by his bunk. He says, what about the drugs on the bus, where did you hide them? And I said, under your pillow. I got the sack about two weeks after that, one of my finest moments. As always with one of Noel's stories, who knows if that's the truth, here's what Clint Boone said. I think towards the end of 1992, Noel's heart wasn't in it anymore. He'd already started with Oasis, he was writing with them, he was rehearsing with them when he had the chance, he was phoning home every night, talking to Liam about his ideas. I think it dawned on us that his heart was no longer with the Inspirals, so we literally let him go. We gave him £2,000 as a golden handshake, which was a lot of money back then. And so, from this point, Noel was no longer torn in two. He could fully commit to Oasis. 1992 was not really a successful year for the band on paper. Not really. They had multiple first-time opportunities, all of which came to nothing. It was, in many ways, however, the year that made them. Their response wasn't to hang up the guitar and go get a job in a call centre. It was to work harder. The rehearsals became absolutely intensive. As the band progressed, so their commitment deepened. To miss rehearsals was a major issue. One Saturday, a good friend of Bonehead's invited him and Kate to his wedding. Bonehead couldn't go. The wedding took place on a rehearsal day, he explained. His friends couldn't believe it, but Bonehead held firm. The band first, other things second. You didn't miss rehearsals for anything. On the day before Bonehead and Kate moved to their home in West Didsbury, the rhythm guitarist called up the Gallagher household and told Liam, I can't make rehearsals. I've got to move house tomorrow and I've got to pack everything up. Liam just slammed the phone down. Bonehead put the phone down and was about to redial the number when the phone rang. This time Noel was on the line. Right you dickhead, he ordered. Get your amps and guitar and get your ass down to the boardwalk or you're out. Tony picks up the story. This was the first rehearsal Bonehead had missed in three years. Noel was not happy. At first we thought he was joking as he himself had missed most of the rehearsals for the last 12 months away with the Inspirals. It seems he wasn't joking. I don't give a fuck, Noel told Bonehead over the phone. Either get down here or I'm gonna sack you. His eyes then widened as Bonehead told him what he thought of him and also informed him he was on the way down to kick his fucking head in. Noel laughed this off, but you could see the fear darting away behind his eyes. We made our way outside to await the impending arrival of Bonehead. His car pulled to a halt and he hopped out, his face red with rage. Who the fuck do you think you are, he started. You can't fucking sack me. He then blasted Noel, who stood there wearing a sullen look. You could see that Noel was not really listening to him. He was just trying to figure out how to get away from a potential slapping. Bonehead was not a happy man and looked like he was about to start swinging. Liam then jumped in and defended Bonehead, which gave Noel a timely and dignified escape route. Yeah, you fucking support him, Noel hissed at Liam and turned on his heels. Look, Bonehead shouted at Liam, I've got to move house, I can't do anything about it, I'll be here tomorrow. See you tomorrow night then, Liam casually remarked and then disappeared into the boardwalk, leaving a speechless Bonehead out on the street. It's the only major ruck he has ever had with Noel. And that just goes to show how seriously they took their careers behind the scenes. The band came first. And, as we've already heard Bonehead mention in another interview, they were literally willing to lose their friends over it. That's how committed they were. Bonehead said this to Rolling Stone in 1996. When we started the band, people would say, come to the pub, have a few beers, 
but we'd say no, we're rehearsing. I had two mates who I'd known all my life that were getting married and they said, come to my wedding. And I said, no disrespect, but I'm working, I'm rehearsing. That's how serious we were. So at the end of the day, there's no one left for us in Manchester. They've all said, fuck off. And so the band responded to their failures by trying harder. They rehearsed more and more and no one was allowed to miss a practice. Noel kept writing better songs and was still constantly hammering on doors behind the scenes. However, I believe it had begun to dawn on him that he couldn't do everything himself. He needed some outside help. And as it happened, in that regard, 1993 would turn out to be their year. The company Noel's girlfriend worked for was called Red Alert, and Noel, being in this push every door mentality, tried to promote the latest Oasis demo as much as possible, sending it via Red Alert to every record label he could find. Paul Gallagher recalls, Red Alert was sending copies of the demo tape out for Oasis, prompted by Noel. They worked for a whole list of record companies including London, EMI, One Little Indian, Mute, Virgin, Sony and Brilliant. Noel would go into Red Alert's office and use the fax machine and photocopier, setting up gigs and trying to hustle a deal. Needless to say, all these labels rejected the band. And I reckon this is the point at which it must have dawned on Noel that the problem wasn't the record labels being bastards. The problem was they needed to improve. And again, this just goes to show the sheer dogged persistence of Noel back in that day. And it also shows why he was considered the band leader. It's not because he stormed in and dominated everything. It's because he did all the dirty work. You could see that same dynamic in the band all through the 90s, even when they were signed. Noel was behind the scenes doing all the work, while the rest of them were in the pub a lot of the time. And Noel was doing all that stuff in the early days when there was no money and no guarantee that there would ever be any money. Noel was the leader of the band because behind the scenes he was the one constantly trying to push the thing forward. In early 1993 the band played a gig in Liverpool at a venue called Libato, supporting a band called Smaller. Which of course as many of you guys know was fronted by a lunatic scouse lad called Digsy. When they rolled up to the venue, Digsy heard the band sound checking and realised they were better than his band, and so he offered that they could headline and he would support them. Now Digsy is the cousin of two other very important Scouse lads to this story, Chris and Tony Griffiths. Founding members of the Liverpool band The Real People, who were then signed to CBS Records. Noel had met them on tour with the Inspiral Carpets and they'd become good mates. So when Oasis performed again at the boardwalk in January of 1993, once again, it was as an audition. It was a gig with a purpose because the real people were in the audience and Noel needed someone to help him produce the band's sound. Having sent their demo out to every record label he could find, Noel had realized that they had been turned down because they weren't good enough. And so the real people who he'd made friends with, who were signed, who had more experience of production and studio technique were invited to the gig. It was another audition to further the band. Oasis played their customary short set to an audience of about 50 people. Now they had two new songs in the set list. They were Rock and Roll Star and Bring It On Down. They were the songs enthuses Tony Griffiths. It was obvious to anyone standing there what was going on on stage it was just fucking boss. We'd been setting up our own studio in a place called Porter Street in Dock Road, a big warehouse which had like three floors. We'd set up an eight track studio in this large room and at the same time we were about to produce our album. We didn't have any gigs to do so we basically ended up working for Oasis for three months. We recorded about 12 tracks and it was really, really good. If you'd like to know more about what went on between Oasis and The Real People, you can check out my video on that story. I'm not gonna go too deep into that right now because that's another whole feature in and of itself. And you can also watch my interview with them down in Liverpool for some further reading, if you like. The Real People took them on and recorded them in their Bootle studios. And while there, they created the live demonstration tape of which only a few copies were ever made but which has passed into rock and roll legend. Tony says, we left after three months of sheer lunacy, bedlam and mind-bending sessions. The band was tight and we'd never sounded as good. 
We'd had a new set of songs and Noel was still working on new ideas born there. So in January, they played at the boardwalk auditioning for the real people. The next three months, February, March and April, they spent working with them at Bootle recording their demo. And that brings us to May of 1993. Back now in Manchester, Oasis were sharing their rehearsal space with another band called Sister Lovers. And one of the band members, Debbie Turner, apparently had a romantic history with the head of Creation Records, Alan McGee. Now, of course, May 1993, the time the band went to King Tut's in Glasgow and got signed, that whole event is shrouded in loads and loads of made up stories and myth making. But here's what I think might have actually happened in the run up to the day they finally got signed. I think after splitting up, Debbie of the Sister Lovers and Alan McGee actually remained on good terms. And I think Alan helped to get Debbie on the bill. And I reckon Debbie invited Oasis to go up and play with them because she knew the head of a major indie label in the UK was going to be in the audience. I think she'd been talking to Noel and agreed to do it. This was yet another gig that was really an audition. I think they went up to Glasgow with this knowledge that McGee was going to be there through the Debbie connection. Because why else would they rent a van and drive all the way from Manchester to Glasgow when they weren't even on the bill. There is an interview somewhere where Alan McGee says he showed up to that gig randomly to make Debbie uncomfortable. But there is also another one where he admits that actually he went along by prior arrangement to support her because they were still on good terms. But there are so many different versions of the King Tut story that you can kind of choose your own adventure really. And of course, most people do know the story from here on in. Alan McGee was in the audience, he heard the band, the band were offered a record deal and went on to conquer the world. And of course you can find out more about what happened at King Tut's and some of the various rumours and stories on other videos on my channel. But that's not the purpose of this video. The point of this video is to ask the question, how did Oasis go from nothing in 1991 to that massive deal with Creation Records in May of 93. And I don't know what you guys reckon, but to me, the whole thing seems to basically rest on Noel Gallagher's shoulders and his refusal to ever take no for an answer. I think he took every opportunity that opened up, for good or for bad, and pushed it as hard as possible. He wasn't just passive, waiting for opportunities. He took the ones that came naturally, but he was also aggressively sending out demos, hammering on doors, and if doors wouldn't open, looking for new ones. But I reckon there's two distinct halves to how Oasis did it. There's everything Noel was doing, but there's also the fact that the band were not too proud to accept they needed to change. When they realised that they weren't yet good enough, they weren't slick enough to get any industry interest, they became a disciplined machine powered by an unstoppable work ethic. They had relentless, almost military levels of constant rehearsal with the threat of sacking if anyone didn't attend. When there was something missing, something wrong, Noel didn't just give up, he began to assess the problem and figure out a way through. There's a well-worn cliche that really applies here. Failure is feedback. Back when they were fighting to get noticed, back when they were trying to get a deal, nothing was random, nothing was aimless. Everything was targeted and strategic. No driving to the arse end of nowhere or playing some country pub to five people for no reason. Every gig seemed to have a strategy behind it, usually masterminded by Noel, to get the band exposure where they needed it. And once they got loads of exposure and discovered no one was interested, they realised they needed to improve, and then did. Many bands don't have the humility or work ethic to take on that kind of negative feedback. But Oasis did. And look what they achieved. To make it today, just as back then, takes relentless dedication. It's easy to be excited and motivated when things are going well. But what about when things aren't going well? What about when things are quiet and there's no movement anywhere? The bands who really make it are the ones who have someone constantly asking why and aggressively kicking at the locked doors or hunting for new ones. The bands who make it 
are the ones who are constantly learning from their failures, who are constantly changing their approach to find a way that works, and who never, ever, ever give up.